All right here we're going to take a look at shape functions for beam elements. All right, let's go ahead and take a look. Here is our beam element. It's going to take a while to draw it, so we'll just go ahead and fast forward. And we want to take a look at like how does this displacement vary throughout that element? That's in yellow. That's the v of x. And here we have transverse displacement when we're looking at beam elements. In the truss element, you look at axial displacement. Beam elements, we're starting to look at like how does that beam deform in the transverse direction. So we have our vertical displacement function, and it's related to the loading by the equation of elastic curve. You might remember this from mechanics of materials, where we have our moment equal to elastic modulus times the area moment of inertia multiplied by the curvature of the beam. Remember that V is the displacement, dV dx is the slope, and d squared v dx squared is how fast that slope changes through as you, as you move through x, and so we would call that the curvature. Oh, well, here's the definitions. There we go. Great, let's go ahead and show another variation. Same equation of the elastic curve. We just put it in terms of the shear force. And we know that the shear is equal to the derivative of the moment with respect to x. And this is true. We're just going to go ahead and assume that E and I are constant in this derivation throughout the element. And finally, we take a look at the distributed load. This is actually another version of the equation of the elastic curve. Note that there is a negative right here. That negative really just means that we're assuming that a positive distributed load is going downward. But it actually doesn't make too much of a difference now because we know that the distributed load must be zero because the loads can only be applied at the nodes. We cannot have any type of distributed load acting throughout that element because the loads can only be applied at the nodes. So that means that the <laughs> the fourth derivative of our displacement function v with respect to x must be equal to zero and that means that our displacement function must be a cubic function, a cubic polynomial in a form just like this. And so now the main question is what are these coefficients and we figure them out by using the boundary conditions. And so what are the boundary conditions? Here is our beam again and you'll see that we have a displacement at node 1. We have a rotation at node 1. We have a displacement at node 2 and we have a rotation at node 2. And so there's our displacement conditions. Here are our rotation conditions. Remember that the rotation is the same thing as the derivative of the displacement function. Here's the same uh, or another rotation boundary condition we have at node 2. So if we go ahead and plug those in, note that these produce four different equations and these four different equations give us four equations to solve for these four unknowns that we have throughout there. All right, so we go ahead and apply those. Well, I think that's exactly what this line says. And we solve for the four unknowns. We rearrange to eventually get something that looks like this. Now put in terms of our shape functions, right? And our displacements or rotations. So there's our shape functions. And in the previous slide, we saw what the dis nodal displacements and rotations were. So rewriting that same equation, we're going to go ahead and take a look into what each of these represent. So I just highlighted the first one in green. That's our first shape function representing V1. You could write out the equation for the first shape function just like that. And we would draw it like this. Notice it kind of has like this S-type shape. And that S-type shape starts with a value of 1.0 there. And it ends up being 0 at the other end, as we would expect. Also notice that the slope is 0 at, those other, at, at either end. And that just indicates the following. We know that our slope must be 0 at x equals 0, and our slope must be 0 at x equals L. So each shape function is going to equal 1 at its corresponding degree of freedom. And it will equal 0 at all the other degrees of freedom that they have. And so while this is true for the first shape function, it's this exact same thing for 
every other shape function. Here we're taking a look at the second shape function, writing out what the equation is, drawing it out. In this case, we're taking a look at the first slope being one. And that's exactly what we have here. So the displacement, or probably the shape function is equal to zero at the first displacement. And it's equal to zero at the second displacement. But if we go ahead and take a look at the slope at the first one, it's equal to one. If you take a slope, look at the slope of the second one, it's equal to zero. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and take a look at the third one. Kind of round this out. You'll probably get an idea of what's happening now. Here's what the shape function can be represented as in the, its cubic polynomial form. Here we're going to go ahead and draw it out. It's kind of like a mirrored about the middle is what our first shape function is. And of course, the shape function is equal to zero at zero. It is equal to one at x equals l. And of course, the slope is zero at both ends. All right, then we'll go, we'll go to the next one. Here's our displacement function written in terms of our shape functions again. We'll highlight the fourth one, write out the cubic polynomial equation for this. Go ahead and draw it out. And here you can see that the value is zero at both ends, but we have a slope of 1.0 at that other end. So there we see our fourth shape function is equal to zero at either end, but its slope is only zero at the first end and it is equal to one at the final end. Okay, so that concludes the der derivation of our shape functions. I did skip a lot of the algebra just because it is, well, it's a little bit not too exciting. So, uh, but as long as you understand the process, that's the main part. The main reflective questions that we have here are, can you describe the difference between a shape function and a displacement function? This is actually taken even from the introduction to shape functions that we did for truss elements, but it's still an important question. So I want to ask it again here. And then we'll say, well, why is the slope of the second shape function equal to 1.0 at x equals 0 instead of the value of the second shape function itself? And then we can ask, well, how does the shape function vary along the length of a beam element? All right, in other words, what type of, what type of polynomial can describe its uh, variation? And we can ask the same question for the displacement function for the beam element. How does it vary along the beam, ele beam element? And what type of polynomial, polynomial can describe that? And that concludes this presentation on the shape functions and displacement function for a beam element.